Okay, like I said, we're going to start working on White Crane, or Crane in general. And uh, I want to start all this off by uh, uh, introducing a little bit of history and legend about White Crane. Um, um, White Crane was uh, founded, or started, or developed by a young lady named Fang Chi Lang, all right, in... Uh, in the province of Fushan, China. Uh, her dad was uh, a skilled fighter in what is basically known as monk fist boxing. Okay, so he taught her the monk fist boxing style to begin with. Okay, so she was an experienced uh, martial artist before she encountered anything having to do with the crane. And there's a number of stories about the about the crane, a number of legendary, legend type stories, mythical or however you want to do it. I'm sure they've changed over the, over the years, um, like stories tend to do when they come down from by word of mouth, because uh, when these stories first came out, they weren't, they're pretty sure they weren't written down. Um, the three basic versions is, uh, two versions are very similar. One of them that she was out working in her yard, essentially, near her house, and the uh, area of China she lived in uh, was known for having lots of cranes, lots of cranes, and you can compare that to uh, down here in Florida, where you would consider we have a lot of cranes uh, compared to like uh, maybe New York City, um, but if you go outside of your house, you may or may not see a crane on a daily basis. You may see, you know, like a blue heron or, or any type of bird of that, uh, that stature, the really large creatures. Um, but apparently in this area of China, these birds were very prolific. They were everywhere. So if you go outside of your house, you might see five or six of these things. And um, they're not small creatures, and they are very strong, and they're very dangerous. Um, so to have them around where you're working or doing your everyday living uh, can, be, can be a bit of a, a hassle, all right? So, um, uh, like I said, her father taught her monk-style boxing, and he was also proficient in uh, what they called stick fighting. And uh, the way they described it was stick fighting, not as, not as staff fighting, as in using a bamboo staff, but it sounds more like as using a scrima-type sticks. But the translations being as they may, they, you know, it's hard to tell whether they were talking about a scrim of sticks or whether they were actually talking about uh, a full bamboo staff. Now, one of these versions was she was working out in the yard or doing whatever she was outside of the house. It doesn't really elaborate on what she was doing. But in her, in her, in, uh, while she was out in the yard, uh, there was a crane that apparently was giving her some kind of grief. Um, and being around cranes down here, we know that cranes generally are not aggressive. If you walk up to a crane, they will generally turn and fly away. Um, but if we have an area where a lot of these birds and the territory is, um, is limited, they can be quite aggressive. So they would try, they would also try to chase her away because she would be considered in the mind of the bird as an aggressor into their territory. So they might be uh, inclined to uh, essentially attack her, right? So she had to defend herself against one of these birds. And so she defended herself with, in this first story, using a stick, okay? Could be a bamboo staff, could be something like an escrima stick, okay? And my assumption is, by the way the story is written, she used a stick fighting skill that she learned from her father to fend off this bird. Now, every time she tried to fight this bird, the bird would evade and would reattack. The bird would block with its wings, would block with its feet. And uh, in one of the versions of this story, the crane actually broke the stick she was using in half. It doesn't say how the crane did that, but the, uh, the story goes that the, that the uh, bird broke the stick in half. Um, now, none of these stories end with her defeating the crane or running the crane off. There is no definitive end of the stories. But um, 
uh, it all has to do with her being inspired by the way the birds behaved. Another version of the story, she was sitting in her bedroom uh, uh, combing her hair, and the crane actually flew onto her windowsill. And she had to fight the crane off the windowsill, pushing back. She had a stick available. She pushed the crane, or tried to push the crane off the windowsill, and it was a bit of a chore, and the bird would not leave. A third version is that she was out in the yard again, and she observed two cranes fighting each other, all right? And as these birds were fighting each other, for some reason she decided that she needed to intervene and take, at this point, that is described as a bamboo staff. She took a bamboo staff and went out and tried to separate the creatures and shoo them away. Now, um, let me reemphasize that, you know, these birds are large and dangerous, and if there is a large number of these creatures around, I would consider five in my yard a large number. Um, they could cause you quite a bit of distress, so shooing them away is probably something you would really want to try to do in her situation. Okay, now the gist of these stories is that she was actually very inspired by the way the crane reacted to her, uh, to her attacks. You know, she tried to hit the crane on the wing, she tried to hit the crane on the head, she tried to poke the crane in the chest, she tried all sorts of different maneuvers, and with each maneuver attacking the bird, the bird was able to deflect and dodge and evade what she was doing, but it never left. Okay, so with the inspiration of this, she took the movements of the crane and she began to study how the cranes reacted in nature, or how the cranes acted in nature, and she applied them to her monk style, her monk this boxing style that she learned from her father. Now the monk style boxing was considered a soft external style of boxing. Okay, we'll get into this hard, soft, external, internal thing later. But the monk fist style was considered soft external. All right, and uh, so the crane movements fit well within this uh, monk style boxing system that she learned from her dad. Now another part of this. Uh, this mythology goes that um, a bunch of thugs from a neighboring village uh, had an issue with her father and killed him in a fight, all right? And uh, so she decided to take revenge, and in the process of taking revenge against this neighboring village or the, the, the thugs from this neighboring village, um, she incorporated into her uh, boxing style the movements of the crane after observing, and this is, this is the portion where she observed the two cranes fighting each other, okay? And uh, so with all these stories, it all culminates down to inspired by the birds, uh, observing the bird's behavior, and incorporating the movements of the bird into the boxing style. Okay, well this young lady, uh, Fang Shi Nang, or Fang Shi Lang most likely is the pronunciation. I'm not real good with Chinese pronunciation, so I could be butchering these names horribly. Um, but she became quite well known um, for this crane style that she had developed. And becoming very well known, she encountered a lot of people who came by to challenge her to fight, which was apparently you know, dueling back then was apparently very common. So if you had, if you were a person of renown, a renowned fighter, then people would come and test their skills against you. So apparently she tested her, she had an opportunity to test her skills against quite a few people. Now there's two versions of, um, of uh, some, some famous fights that she had, okay? Uh, one version was that she fought, let me see if I can find some of my notes here before I carry on here. Um, um, oh yes, the first fighter she, well, not the first one I, would, I wouldn't say, but the first story I encountered about the first well-known fighter that she fought was named Jing Shi, Kishu, okay? I'm probably butchering that pronunciation too, but let's just roll past that. 
Now this fighter was trained in a very hard, very external style of boxing. Um, and he, just, he decided he wanted to match wits with, uh, with Ms. Lane, and so established a match with her. And apparently, it doesn't really go into detail, the, the, the stories, because I can't find a whole lot of detailed stories on this, but there's not a whole lot of detail about the fight, other than the fact that she evaded him easily and eventually defeated him, all right? And it goes on to where uh, uh, this fellow was so impressed with, with being defeated by this soft internal style that he became her disciple. Now, in those days, what a disciple indicated was someone who was a dedicated student. So he dedicated his life to learn her style, okay? Um, and his dedication, he learned it so well that he became known, well known as, as a second generation um, teacher. And uh, a lot of the lineage, can, a lot of the white crane lineage can be directed back to this particular fellow. Um, now, a similar story with a different fellow of a different name, Shin Li Shu. Apparently, this fellow was one of her servants. Now, I don't know much about her family or how much money she had or what it meant by her servant, but um, apparently this fellow was in her employ of some, some sort and for a very long time, as a matter of fact, and because of his... Uh, close proximity to her for a very long time. He was taught her style of white crane. And eventually, he left her service and went back to his hometown where he became a second generator, generation teacher of this white crane style. Um, now, there's a little bit more known about this fellow. Um, he eventually had to um, uh, move to Taiwan to escape the uh, Manchu government who had taken over China at the time and was really causing a lot of trouble with the local populations. And um, so he moved to Taiwan and he opened up uh, a school there in Taiwan to study uh, the white crane. And uh, as it goes, a lot of these martial arts schools at the time turned into what they called secret societies. And not secret in the, in the sense that they were full of mysticism and, and uh, things of that sort, but they were secret because if they weren't, they would be ferreted out and destroyed by the, uh, the reigning governments at the time, okay? So that's a little bit of history about the uh, the white crane. Now, there's also another direction that this goes into. Um, supposedly, her father, the style he studied, he studied it either from the monks at Shaolin, or he was a monk at Shaolin. This is not very clear, but somehow he was affiliated with them in some sort, and that's where this monk style boxing came from. It was a southern Shaolin style. Um, and it's also noted that uh, a lot of White Crane was independently um, developed by different people who never met each other. Um, so it's also theorized that a lot of White Crane, or a lot of Crane in general, was developed in, uh, at Shaolin, at the Shaolin Temple by the monks, independent of uh, Ms. Lang. Other than that, there is, uh, this is, of course, myth and legend, but there's often a whole lot of truth in myth and legend. So um, it's interesting to know these things. I want everybody to, to start getting a feel for the history behind the Kung Fu that we learn, the Kung Fu that we do. Now, we didn't, um, in the adult class, we didn't talk a whole lot about mythology or the history of the mantis style. We brushed over it a little bit and uh, worked on some mantis, but we'll be coming back to that, and with all these styles, we will be poking into these histories, uh, these genealogies, 
uh, and these mythologies because they are important. There's a reason for them. There's a reason why they've lasted, you know, they've lasted the test of time. And um, they help put perspective on what you're doing. Okay, let's talk about that putting perspective on what we're doing. Um, this style, this, white, this particular crane style was developed by a woman, okay? It was developed by a woman in the time of China when most of the things you read about of China in the day um, and in the world of that day was that women were considered pretty much second-class citizens and were not respected of what they said, thought, or did, okay? Well, a lot of these, a lot of these stories I read about these Kung Fu related women do not hold to that pattern, okay? So if that pattern was true in a hardcore system back then in, in China, why would her father bother to teach his daughter, a female, the fighting art? Well, my explanation is that, you know, a parent, um, a parent's love for their child transcends what society will impose on you, okay? So um, he felt the need, for some reason, to teach her this, to keep her safe from enemies, because there were enemies all around, apparently. He was, he was done in by thugs in his day from a neighboring village, so he felt that she needed the ability to defend herself, and apparently uh, he wanted her to have the ability to defend herself, to keep on living in the, you know, in, in, the, in the society of the day. Now, with that being said, uh, Wing Chun is also a Chinese martial art that was developed by a woman. Wing Chun itself is the name of the woman that developed the style. Um, and we'll go into that later, too. We'll not, uh, we'll not uh, uh, study that too much today, but... Um, you need to make note that, you know, the idea that women were completely considered second-class citizens was not, was not wholly true, and they are completely disrespected was not wholly true. Um, the legend of these, uh, this one fighter, this hard external trained fighter, uh, uh, Zing Shizu, um, who had a desire to come fight, to fight, to test his, his ability against her, um, stands to stands against that uh, that train of thought. If he didn't think that she had anything worth uh, testing against, he wouldn't have bothered. After all, she was a girl of was China, and you know who cares what a woman has to say or do in, in, in society at that time? Well, apparently that's not true because he did challenge her. He did go fight with her. He lost his fight to her, and he became her disciple. All right, that speaks volumes into what uh, you know how how women were actually treated and respected back in that day, too. So there's a dichotomy in the society there. Um, don't always believe what you hear. Don't always believe what you're told. Um, there were some atrocities committed on females at the time back then, but apparently not with all of them. Okay, so women throughout history have persevered through this these trials and have become quite famous, all right? And this is one example, all right? Um, all right, so that being said, I think we're going to lay the history aside for now, and we're going to come back to this a little bit later, um, and we're going to, uh, oh yeah, just a, just a note here, she lived in the village of Yongchun, and that is the name given to the white crane style that she developed was uh, Yongchun white crane. All right, just just to throw that out there. 